So yeah, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Um, so 90, it's been 95 years uh, since Eugene Debs died, uh, but even all this time later, he's still, uh, he looms large on the American left. Among the pantheon of uh, historical left-wing leaders and, and organizers, Debs is, uh, among, is today among the most quoted and most cited, uh, it, you know, and it's worth asking why, why is this the case? It, you know, Debs's personal style, his, you know, personal kindness, his passion for justice and his dedication uh, to the fight for a better world uh, certainly makes him a compelling figure, but that I don't think that adequately explains why uh, he has this appeal um, for everyone who's ever heard of him. You know, I think, you know, people know just things about him, like uh, him, uh, you know, running from pr for president from prison and getting a million votes and stuff like this and just being, uh, you know, sort of this incredible figure. Uh, but yeah, it's worth asking why, you know, what is the value of, of the example of Debs for people who believe in socialism today. And so in this presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll give an, an, a brief overview of, of what I believe to be Debs's most crucial political ideas, which can and should be applied to our own organizing today in this fight for a better world. And I think first though, it's, it's, an, it's uh, necessary to give at least a gloss on his biography, uh, just in order to give you the idea of the conditions in which he came up with these ideas, because these ideas that he landed on were forged through his experience in decades of struggle and uh, political organizing, workplace organizing. And he really, uh, you know, he didn't become a socialist until he was in his early 40s. Um, so he really uh, took his time uh, getting to it, but, you know, he, uh, yeah, I mean, everything everything that he eventually came to believe was uh, forged through his experience in the class struggle. And so, yeah, just to start out with, you know, he was born in 1855. He grew up in, in the uh, aftermath of the Civil War. As a young man, he worked on the railroad and uh, quickly became a leader in the Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen, which was a mutual benefit society, essentially, that uh, had some aspects of, of a union to it, but was explicitly against class struggle and uh, did not negotiate uh, on behalf of the workers. It was mostly a sort of charitable organization where uh, the people paid dues to it and they doled out uh, death, like funeral benefits and stuff like that So for, the, for these workers. Um, and, and Debs quickly became an officer in this. And uh, he, was, he, was a, he was a liberal at this point. And he, uh, in, in, as a leader of the B of LF, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen in the 1870s and 80s, uh, Debs was far from the militant labor leader that he was eventually going to become. Uh, and he argued uh, for conciliation between workers and capitalists, uh, basically uh, labor peace. Uh, and he explicitly rejected socialism or uh, the idea of class struggle and, uh, as, and, and waging strikes as a, as a way to benefit workers. So that's kind of, that's kind of pretty far off from the Debs that we remember. Uh, and, and, and he totally rejected the idea of socialism. And he was in fact a, a prominent Indiana Democrat um, in, the, in the 1880s and, and was elected multiple times as the Terre Haute city clerk and uh, was, was uh, served a term as a state assemblyman. So he was, uh, he was a, a reformer, but very cautious and, uh, and not uh, the revolutionary that he would one day become. Um, he, even though he was a moderate reformer, he worked vigorously on behalf of the workers that he was representing as an officer. He was constantly traveling across the country to organize new locals and to go and badger individual 
employers into, into paying their workers more and giving them more benefits. And he did this and, and pretty quickly became frustrated and realized that the workers couldn't get very far when they were organized in this sort of narrow craft basis, which means that you know, this, this union was only organized the firemen, and there are about 20 other trades that they all work together on the railroad, and they're all necessary for the running of the trains, but they were all organized into these separate unions. And, and he recognized that the, the, the railroad workers needed an industrial union that would cover every single worker who worked on the, on the rails and, uh, and negotiate collectively for them. He was, he, even when he believed this, he was still pretty uh, reticent about you know, class struggle and, and, and even uh, thinking of the strike as a useful tactic. Uh, but so he said to the, he said to setting up this industrial union and uh, years of effort culminated in the foundation of the American Railway Union in 1893. Uh, pretty quickly, the ARU uh, was thrust into a major industrial conflict when 4,000 railroad car manufacturing uh, workers in the Chicago suburb of, of Pullman, Illinois, which was a company town that was run with pretty tyrannical conditions and, and really horrifying uh, really horrifying um, labor conditions and also uh, living conditions for the workers. And so 4,000 of these workers revolted in a wildcat strike in the spring of 1894. And Debs, even though he was still very hesitant about class struggle and stuff, sort of threw himself and the ARU into this because he saw it as an opportunity to benefit and organize all uh, tons more railroad workers. And so what they did was they called, the ARU called a national boycott of any train that was carrying uh, Pullman cars, which are just these uh, type of railway, railway car. And so this is a lot of trains. And uh, pretty quickly, something like 250,000 workers become involved in this strike. It's, it's totally off the chain. And there are like... Uh, you know, uh, there are huge riots in Chicago. Um, it's millions and millions of doll uh, dollars and in, in damage to uh, that the railways are, are losing to this labor struggle. And it becomes a big problem uh, for, for the government and for the capitalist class. And so Grover Cleveland, who was the president at that point, ordered a court injunction on the strike, basically said, you can't do that anymore. And, uh, and you know, Debs and the ARU said, screw you. And so uh, Cleveland sent out the army to keep the trains running because it was becoming a serious issue where, you know, when you stop trains from moving, that becomes a pretty serious issue for if you're a, a businessman um, in any sort of uh, trade or, or business. And uh, Debs and all the other strike leaders were uh, arrested and imprisoned, and the ARU was forcibly dissolved. So, sort of inauspicious beginnings for uh, for Debs. It was, you know, an incredible struggle, but ultimately one that went down in in, in failure. And this struggle really changed Debs because he, you know, he realized through it that well, this is really a class struggle. You know, it is war between the working class and the capitalist class. The, the bosses are willing to resort to these tactics that I've been really hesitant about for a long time, you know, actual militancy and, uh, and uh, you know, struggle in, in, in every terrain. And so in, in, he spent six months in prison uh, for, for uh, violating that court injunction. And during this time, he, he spent a lot of time reflecting on this and reading socialist literature that uh, his admirers were sent him because he was already a national figure at this point. Uh, but people mailed him books by Edward Bellamy, who was a prominent American socialist, books by Karl Kautsky, who was the foremost Marxist theoretician in the world at that time. And, uh, and Victor Berger, who would one day become uh, Debs's rival within the party uh, visited him and gave him all three cap uh, volumes of Marx's Capital, and Debs uh, supposedly 
read each page very carefully and, and uh, gleaned some very important lessons from that. Because when he emerged from prison, just two years later, much to the surprise of you know everyone who had known this guy, uh, he declared himself a socialist at uh, at a at a rail at railroad worker convention. And uh, there's a quote where he says, you know, the issue is socialism versus capitalism. And that's basically, that's it. <laughs> and I am for socialism. I, I am against capitalism. And now that he had come to socialism, he set out to organize a party for the socialists. And this uh, took, this took uh, a few years. And uh, he, he, first he ran for president. Uh, in 1900 uh, on the Social Democratic Party ticket. Wasn't a super impressive race or anything. He didn't garner a whole lot of support. Um, and after a little bit of, uh, a little bit more organizing, they came to organize the Socialist Party of America, which came out of a merger of two different parties, uh, the Social Democratic Party and the Socialist Labor Party. And so this is in 1901. And, and uh, you know, the, the party quickly began to grow and uh, all throughout its existence, uh, up until the early 20s, Debs was the SP's most prominent public figure. Uh, he, make, he made uh, quadrennial runs for president um, and he was almost constantly touring the country. Uh, speaking in every town, every mining camp, every, uh, every lumber camp. Uh, he spoke to big picnics. He spoke to tent revivals in the South. Uh, he was all over the place and, uh, and he was very serious about organizing this party and he really poured his life into it and was very successful because the, the party grew rapidly to uh, be over 100,000 members, which was pretty impressive uh, even today. Um, but especially at the time, at, by 1912, that had that many members. And they also elected hundreds and eventually over a thousand elected officials. There were socialist congressmen, socialist mayors, socialist state legislators, socialist dog catchers, you know, everything else. So this, and, and uh, it was very impressive. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, Debs was the de facto leader of this party, uh, essentially, but in reality, he was often at odds with other parts of the national leadership of the Socialist Party, which was dominated by more conservative elements, especially on questions of identity-based oppression, which we'll discuss more later, and what the Socialist Party's orientation towards labor should be. You know, Debs was a founding member of the Industrial Workers of the World, which is a militant industrial union. Uh, and he believed in industrial unionism and militancy, uh, labor militancy, uh, that he believed that those things were necessary components of social struggle, crucial components, whereas the more conservative leadership uh, de-emphasized class struggle and instead opted for a sort of gradual approach uh, that focused on, on legislative uh, reform. And, and, and despite often being on the losing side of issues within the party, because he was to the left um, in the party, uh, Debs refused to compromise on his fundamental principles. Uh, these were principles that Debs had learned through all these decades of struggle. And he knew that they were right. He knew he was right. And he stuck with them through thick and thin. And, uh, you know, I think we could probably do a dozen red squares on, on Debs as a figure and uh, on the Socialist Party as an organization. Uh, but I I'm going to cut off the uh, biographical stuff here. I, I could keep going on, but uh, I think it, it would be good to just get to what are these principles that we that uh, socialists today should learn from that that Debs kind of came up with through these decades of struggle. And uh, you know, if you are interested in learning more about the SP, I, I did put together like a little a little list of uh, introductory articles that I would recommend, uh, and I'll share that at the end. Um, 
because there's it, it's a it's a great history. It's good to know about, and it also offers an interesting uh, example for for those of us who are in DSA today, who who in many respects have the same mission that that Debs and the Socialist Party had. So first of all, underlying uh, everything that Debs did in his life was his fundamental belief in, in democracy. First of all, Debs was a believer in absolute political democracy. Uh, in fact, he denounced the US Constitution as an autocratic and reactionary document in every, uh, in every sense of denial of democracy. And was, was, he was an absolute uh, believer in, in free speech, freedom of, assemb of assembly, things that were violated by the Wilson government uh, in, in, uh, in uh, when the U.S. became involved with in World War One uh, to crack down on, on socialist and, and draft dodgers, um, and he, uh, the Socialist Party organized to for democratic reforms like uh, abolishing the Electoral College, abolishing the Senate, and extending suffrage uh, to everyone. In, including men and women uh, and, and across racial lines as well. Uh, you know, things that uh, we're still fighting for today and, and are really crucial pieces of, of uh, our, our struggle. Uh, Debs also believed in economic democracy. And, and in fact, he once remarked that socialism is merely an extension of the ideal of democracy into the economic field. Then and now, uh, the American workplace is, is functionally a dictatorship where the boss uh, and the bosses who are in the minority exercise dictatorial control, absolute control over the majority, the, the workers. And, um, you know, things are in di different in some respects now, but fundamentally, they remain the same. And uh, lastly, but 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 uh, not least, uh, Debs was a firm believer in organizational democracy. Uh, he believed that in the union and in the party, uh, the rank and file should be given the highest consideration, that they're the heart of the organization and should be treated as such. And, and uh, there are some great Debs quotes about uh, how he doesn't care about the leaders, he cares about the rank and file, uh, good stuff. Um, so that's democracy. How do you get to democracy, though? That's a really good question. Uh, and eventually, through all these years of struggle, Debs realized that the only way to achieve full economic and political democracy was through waging class struggle. To win concessions from the capitalist class and eventually to win socialism, Debs recognized that it was necessary to organize millions of workers into a single organization that could fight in uh, their shared collective interest. Coordinated mass action uh, by a significant portion of the working class was and is the only way to progress towards socialism. And Debs's idea of class struggle stood in stark contrast to the strategy adopted by right-wing socialists like Victor Berger, who I mentioned earlier, who was the leader of the uh, Wisconsin State Socialist Party. Um, he, he, Berger, in fact, once bragged that the socialist government of Milwaukee uh, had successfully put down every strike during their administration. So kind of a far cry from uh, Debs's view of things. Uh, and yeah, so while Debs saw class struggle as, as a vehicle through which to advance socialism, conservative socialists mostly abandoned it and instead uh, took on uh, class collaborationist uh, tactics and uh, kind of settled for doing little reforms and uh, getting more uh, socialist elected and, and focusing purely on uh, electoral um, reform and, and uh, parliamentary reform, essentially. Uh, part and parcel of this belief in the centrality of, of class struggle for Debs was uniting all working class people into, into one sort of politically coherent body. And this you know, included men and women, 
uh, black and white workers and native born and immigrant workers. Because uh, you know, prejudice was against all these different groups was so widespread then, uh, it, this was a controversial position for Debs to hold, even within the Socialist Party, which was outwardly committed to the liberation of all of humanity, but was in practice uh, really hesitant about uh, organizing across racial lines, for instance. But even though it was controversial, Debs uh, really uh, stuck by his guns uh, on these questions and uh and uh i got my papers mixed up i'm sorry uh he and he uh he stuck by his guns and successfully got the party to commit to organizing black workers and uh successfully defeated proposals to back uh, restrictions on immigration at a socialist party convention so in practice, uh, the Socialist Party was not super uh, successful in organizing across racial lines because there was really this fundamental prejudice and a lot of the rank and file. Um, but Debs was still, you know, there were there were limited successes in, in getting uh, black membership. And uh, yeah, so despite this really dogged opposition of, of the more conservative socialist, Debs uh, was was really committed to pushing the idea, not only that everyone has a common uh, you know, sense of humanity, but further that prejudice is, is uh, in racial discrimination, gender discrimination and uh, attacks on immigrants are one of the crucial ways in which bosses divide workers and uh, you know, when the workers are div divided, it's it's very easy to defeat them. And and so, for example, by necessity in, in a multiracial workplace, when you're, you know, uh, organizing there, you have to organize across racial lines, because if you don't, it's very easy for the boss to play the different uh, races or ethnicities off, off of each other. And, uh, but when they're united in one fighting force, then uh, it's, it, the, the boss starts to sweat a little bit because that's uh that's you know pretty scary because if when uh, everyone is united against you and this sense of class solidarity also extended beyond us borders uh debs was a dedicated internationalist and he believed that the global forces of capital could only be overcome by the global forces of the working class and uh you know the the clearest articulation of this is in, in uh, during World War One, when uh, every European Socialist Party endorsed their respective countries' war efforts. Debs and the American Socialists rallied against rallied against uh, U.S. involvement in the war, and and were really clear about the fact that this is a, this is a war that was that is started by capitalists. Uh, we have no interest in killing working class people from different countries. Uh, you know, really, our our shared collective interest as working class people of the world is is to have peace. And uh, you know, of course, it it that uh, didn't quite work out. Uh, but it was a very noble effort, and uh, certainly more noble than uh, the efforts of say the German or, or French socialists who. Uh, basically folded uh, and uh, endorsed um, endorsed their country's respective uh, war efforts. And lastly, uh, I think another key insight that Debs had was that you know there's often this sort of um, dichotomy between class and party and, and socialist organizing. And Debs realized that, and this is in the Canton speech, I think, where he says, political action and industrial action must supplement and sustain each other. You will never vote the socialist republic into existence. You have to lay its foundations in industrial organization. And, and he goes on to talk about this a little more in that speech and in other places. But the idea is that you can't 
organized solely in, in the economic sphere or solely in the political sphere. When you organize solely in the political sphere, you end up like uh, the Wisconsin Socialists with Victor Berger, where you're abandoning class struggle as a tactic and sort of settling for uh, class conciliation, class collaboration, and uh, just gradualist uh, a gradualist approach to making change, which, as it turns out, doesn't work very well. And on the other hand, when you uh, focus solely on, on economic organization, you also run into problems because you're essentially abandoning a, an important terrain of struggle, uh, the state, to, to the bosses, and, and you're uh, limiting the sort of victories that, that, you can, that you can win. And, you know, rather than that, it's necessary to organize in both and to do it in a coordinated way, where, as Deb said, these two efforts are supplementing and sustaining each other, because that's the only way that um, you're going to create a sustainable class organization. And, uh, you know, I mean, really, the idea is that capitalists are organizing in, uh, in both the workplace and uh, in the government. It's necessary for socialists and for the working class to do the same. So that's those are the three ideas that I that I uh, think are are really crucial for socialists today to understand. And I think uh, in many respects we're living in a, a different world than Eugene Debs and his uh, generation of socialist organizers were. But at a very fundamental level, it is it is the same. You know, these there are still these same class relations, even if they have a different veneer or. Uh, a different, uh, you know, there there are certain different things, but but the relationship between labor and capital is still basically the same, and so these are still questions, you know, these questions of class and party, of of class struggle versus uh, gradualism are are still questions that are relevant for the socialist movement today, and they're they're well worth thinking about, and I think. Uh, Eugene Debs, who uh, has the the rare honor of being one of the people in history who uh, who never missed, you know, he was he was right about uh, a lot of stuff, which is it, it's sort of incredible because usually when it's someone of this generation, you they're racist or uh, you know they're sexist or something, but he he really uh, he he didn't miss, uh, which is impressive. So he's he's definitely someone worth listening to, and. I, you know, I also think it's important for socialists to know history, especially the history of working class struggle and socialist struggle, because, you know, we can apply the lessons that uh, our predecessors learned to the present context. You know, like I said, things are different now, but uh, they're different, but the same, I guess. So that is uh, that is my presentation. Thank you, everyone.